no, la verdad sí que da guay para ti. Hay personas conectadas. Sí, no sé si es Okay. Uh, for those that are online, we're about to start in a couple of minutes, okay? Lo voy a mover tantito porque que hay un hoyo. Hay una tapa que la puedes poner si quieres para... Sí, poner una tapa. Esa tapa. Ah, va, perfecto, porque si estaba Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So welcome to this Bioinfo for Women seminar. Uh, today we have the pleasure to bound with uh, Sofia Trejo. She's a researcher here at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center at the High Performance Artificial Intelligence uh, Group of the Computer Science Department. Uh, she's specialized in the social, legal, political, environmental, and cultural uh, impacts of artificial intelligence. She holds a PhD on mathematics from the University of Warwick. And she's also worked as a researcher at the University of uh, Sao Paulo and the Imperial College of, of London. She's a member of the Feminist AI Research Network, the FAIR uh, Network, and she has been part of the Advisor Council for the uh, Federal Institute of Telecommunications in Mexico and was co-leader of the National Agenda of Artificial Intelligence uh, in Mexico. So, Sofia, uh, welcome. Thank you for giving this presentation and the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I'm really nervous. I never given a talk in front of so many people <laughs> because math, <laughs> we never get that many people. <laughs> uh, but okay, it's a pleasure for me to introduce this project. Uh, this is the first project that I colored and co design in AI ethics and the first one that we secure funding for. So, <laughs> uh, so the actual name of the project, uh, which was funded by the Feminist AI Research Network FAIR, is that's obviously a technical name, conversational agent to support the, wor the worthy exercise of interpretation in indigenous languages in the legal field, <laughs> you know, research names. Uh, so the idea of this talk will be to give you an overview of the whole research process and what led us to the decision that AI was not the right solution for the problem that we're trying to tackle. Uh, so I'm going to give an overview of everything. I hope you find this interesting and, and it adds to methodology particularly. So these are some of the collaborators in the project. Most of them are based in Mexico. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about the team. So I was the co-leader along with Ivan. Uh, she worked, uh, sorry, <laughs> he works in natural language processing uh, uh, at the National Autonomous University in Mexico. And he uh, has worked in the creation of indigenous language translators. Then we have Gabi. She is a co-coordinator of translation and interpretation at Sepia Death. This organization will I'll mention later. 
Uh, she's an interpreter and a translator. And she's a speaker of Mixteco variant of the Oeste Alto. And then we also had Antonio. Uh, he is a researcher in the linguistic section of the National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico. And he has worked in several uh, uh, research projects related to translation and interpretation, particularly within the Mayan language. Uh, in addition to this research team, we had collaborators. So these are the names of the uh, indigenous interpreters who took part in the workshops that we held in Oaxaca. And their contributions to this work were essential. And so obviously here are their acknowledgements. So I'm gonna start with the conceptualization of the work because I think it's important to understand how we arrived to the design that we proposed. So first, uh, the idea was, uh, well, it, it came up as a part. So we held a series of events on digital self-determination, uh, which was held at the National Center of the Arts in Mexico. And they were representative of all CEPIADET. So CEPIADET, the name is Centro Profesional Indígena de Asesoría y Defensa y Traducción. This is an indigenous in organization. That's the translation of the name in English. Uh, so I'm going to use their name, CEPIADET, like the acronym. Uh, so they, they participated in these dialogues as well as Antonio. And they highlighted the importance that it has for indigenous people to have access to justice. We'll talk why this is a, an important issue in Mexico, uh, but particularly they highlighted the importance that interpretation of indigenous languages has in all these processes to access justice, which might not be surprising, but it's actually really important. So uh, we started with an exploration of how to develop an AI system to aid with access to justice for indigenous people in Mexico. And the first idea that we discussed with Ivan, myself, and Antonio was first, uh, we wanted to help with the first stage to actually have access to interpretation, which is, uh, it might not sound very surprising, to identify the language and the variants. So there's the first step in order for people to actually have an interpreter. So Antonio has experience in this field, and actually you don't need a lot of tools, at least in Mayan, you can do it, uh, identify the variants with only within five and 10 words. So the pronunciation of five to 10 words will tell you specifically which variant of the Mayan language people speak. So with that idea, we thought, okay, we don't need to create a whole AI which will translate languages. We can only create a system which will allow to identify variants with only a few interactions with users, which will be already very handy. So we talked to Sepia Dead about this idea and they said, okay, obviously it will be useful to identify which linguistic needs people have. But uh, in order for this system to actually have a, an impact, it will need to be adopted by the government. So by the legal and the justice system in Mexico. And in addition, even if you find uh, the, 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 the variant and the language, there is no <laughs> guarantee that you get an interpreter. So there is many issues that I'm going to talk about uh, that relates to the, the work of interpreters which actually represent a barrier from actually getting access to interpretation. So, uh, so we decided to change the design, the first proposal, because it was important for our project to first align with uh, digital autonomy and self-determination for indigenous nations. And the fact that this project for it to have a positive impact will depend on the government. Uh, it was not, it was not aligned with it, what we wanted to, to, to I don't know, <laughs> for the principles of our project. So we decided to change the design and I'm, I'm gonna tell you what we decided to do, but first I'm gonna talk a bit about interpretation uh, and access to justice for indigenous people in Mexico. So you have an idea of the context and why we decided to develop the project that we did. Uh, so first it's important to mention that Mexico has 68 indigenous languages of which there's 364 variants. Uh, so more than 7,300,000 people speak indigenous languages in Mexico. Uh, this corresponds to approximately 6.1% of the population. This is according to official figures, uh, according to the national census. So obviously there's discrepancies here. But uh, in order to get a better understanding, there is uh, this distribution, the distribution of indigenous language speakers. Uh, the shade of the blue represents the percentage of uh, people in that state which are indigenous language speakers. Uh, so the state, which I don't have a pointer, but 
The one that has 31.2%, I don't know if you can see it, it's like one of the three on the bottom, is Oaxaca, which has the largest, uh, largest number of indigenous language speakers and the biggest uh, linguistic diversity. That's where Sepia Dead is based, and that's the state where we held the workshops and whose interpreters we work with. So uh, what else is important? Uh, yep, so something else in order to understand interpretation in Mexico first, it's important to say that uh, it's uh, a constitutional right for indigenous people to actually have access to an interpreter in all legal procedures uh, and in all trials. And this person only not only has to speak their language, but has to understand their culture. So that is a constitutional right. And in addition to that, uh, in 2003, there was released this general law for linguistic rights for indigenous people, who actually establishes the creation not only of a, a, a national infrastructure to guarantee rights in related to, uh, to indigenous languages. So we didn't have this before. And currently, the problem is that there is a huge gap between the regulation and actually the practices. And this is a problem that interpreters are facing. Uh, so in order to understand better what's happening, uh, so just, just to give an idea, Oaxaca, this is a state I told you about. Uh, so 90% of the indigenous inmates who are held in detention currently, or at least to the, the, those statistics, uh, did not count with the assistance of an interpreter. So it's a very serious issue. Most of the indigenous people who are incarcerated at, in, in Mexico at this moment did not have an indigenous interpreter during the trials or during the procedures. Yeah. So, uh, so what happens with the experience of people who are actually doing the work of interpreters? No? So we want to help access to justice. So we want to help people who are actually doing the work of interpretation. So, uh, so this is some of the experiences that we gather from our um, dialogues not only with Sepiadet, but with Antonio, who has worked as an interpreter and a translator for a long time. So, and this is our only some of them, but there is lack of access to formal work. Obviously, this represents barriers to have access to working rights and to social benefits. Then there is uh, no clear understanding of the role. So often witnesses and even the defendants assume that the role of the interpreters is to actually agree with them and help them <laughs> in their trials or in their cases, uh, which is not what they're meant there to do. And then there is uh, also no follow-up on the development of interpretation. So there, are, there is no government like trace of what interpreters uh, are certified or which languages. So for example, it's a very big issue to, to identify gaps or for example, languages and variants which need certified interpreters in order to act uh, within the legal system. So there is as well uh, payments. That's the biggest issue that everybody highlighted as the most common one that they're experiencing. So payments, either they're non-existent or they're delayed. They don't get paid for transfers. They do not get paid for insurance to travel to other communities. And often these are remote communities. So they have to spend like a day or like many, many hours. And none of this is covered. And that time is not considered within their payments, for example. So then there's access to training and certification programs. This is a systemic issue that the government has not, for example, there's no, I think at, at university level, there's just one, uh, one like right now uh, degree that you can get on, it's on indigenous interpretation and translation, but there is no <laughs> like extended uh, access to training or certification. We, and then there is discrimination uh, of all sorts, particularly within the legal system. So this is just to, so you can get an idea of the actual experience of people who are doing this work. Uh, and then obviously there is no official data to according to this. So this data we gather or like some organizations that Sepiadet like have some reports on the interpreters that they work on and some other organizations, which you have to think that most of organizations work within a state and that has only some certain languages. So there is no national coverage and there is no extent, uh, extensive work on this field. So, uh, so the idea was, okay, so let's try to build that system to see if we can help gather data at a national level, which will help uh, the indigenous uh, interpreters. So the idea uh, or the first question is if we could find uh, a way to create an AI, which will aid collective 
uh, the collective improvement of working conditions for the interpreters and to provide them with tools to influence particularly public policy in terms of interpretation. So the design proposal so that we focus on at the end was a conversational agent. So the idea was that by interacting with the agent, first uh, we'll be able to collect uh, or make visible the problems that they're facing on their work. So they will, uh, they will talk about the issues that they're facing with the agent. Then they will have greater agency and power on decision-making and public policy, even to design their own programs. They don't know what people, uh, what interpreters need or what they're lacking, what are their, <laughs> their needs in terms of work, for example. So this will help map that. And then they will collectively build knowledge and resource, resources useful for their work. So you have to think that th there is no like manuals or things that, for example, glossaries that will help them. So it will be important for them to be able to build their own knowledge about their guild. Uh, so at an individual level, so the system will let them access information in the style of conversational agents. For example, where are the penitentiaries that they have to go to? But you have to think as well that it's important to know what the timetables for the bosses are. These are very seldom. Sometimes they're once a day. Sometimes there are days that they don't have bosses. So all of this information is very useful for them. So to communicate information about problems that they face in the daily work, particularly regarding, for example, the delay of payments or the lack of payments. This is very important for them. And to collectively build knowledge, no? Uh, and they're interested particularly on um, things that have to do with the legal field or glossary of terms that they can use. So those were the intentions of the <laughs> system design at the individual level. And at the group level, well, of course, we'll be able to again get cumulative information uh, which will help bring to light the labor problems that they're facing. As I said, there's no official statistics on this, so we don't know the extent of the problems. Or, and then to serve as basis for design of strategies and programs and to improve public policies. No? So that was the idea of the system. And now I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, how we actually went about <laughs> designing <laughs> the work. So for us, it was very important to incorporate uh, some principles into the work. Uh, we didn't align to any of the known principles. These are the ones that we chose. Uh, so gender perspective, collaboration, co-design, shared benefits, digital autonomy, and data sovereignty. Those are the ones that we chose to be upheld in all the processes and through all the whole of the life cycle. So it was important for everything in the planning of the work. Uh, so, uh, as yet, so I'm going to talk about right now only about the design of the system or the idea uh, uh, that we tried, uh, because in later <laughs> stages we didn't we decided that we didn't have to do the agent, but we will be centered around, for example, digital autonomy and data sovereignty. So we will provide knowledge, tools, support, and infrastructure so we can transfer the technology to the indigenous uh, interpreters organizations. So that will be part of the other stages of the project. So that was part of the idea. But as I said, we stayed at this stage. Uh, and something that was very important, and I think it's very important generally, uh, is to consider power asymmetries. So in our work, uh, it was very important to promote the interpreter's agency, control, and access, not only to the whole research process, but to the results that we were developing. So in order to do that, we developed a series of workshops which I'm gonna talk about later, but as well, we created uh, a research protocol and some collaborations agreements. So this document, there's a format that, um, that is available as well, but it, com it contains clear and accessible information, including a glossary of what the work is about, it includes, for example, the project, the research team information on how to contact everyone. It has full details, which I think is rare, on the funding, where the funding came from, what the funding was used for, like all the budgets. Uh, it, it contained the products of the research because obviously we received funding, so there were some expected outcomes of the work. We made very clear those outcomes and what the licenses for the outcomes because we didn't agree uh, well, we agree with that with the funding agency. So we were very clear on all of that. So this is to guarantee that the, the people who were, came to the workshops had, well, did it following, well, 
it's known as informed consent. So we provide everything beforehand, before giving, like, along with the invitation to come to the workshop. And we are, as well gave them the consent forms that they will have to sign in order for us to be able to use their information. So, okay, so we did all of that. <laughs> and then as well, it's important to say that this methodology or like the, the, the fact that we started with a research protocol and collaborations agreement is based on the proposals that have been put forward for indigenous communities. And a lot of this work relates to the serious issues or that have been happening within medical studies that have been done with indigenous communities in various countries. So they have put forward the need to have this uh, in all work that relates to indigenous communities. So we, we, we follow that, the, those recommendations. Uh, so another important thing, uh, is okay so we did not agree to any of the known AI principles but we did decide to align our project with the care principles for indigenous data sovereignty which have been developed by the global indigenous data alliance which is called GIDA and these are the these are the principles I'm going to very briefly explain you each of the principles they have sub principles and if you're interested GIDA has a website and you can they have documents and everything so you can access them but I'm gonna explain very briefly what the, what the principles are and how we decided to like incorporate them into our work. So first of all, uh, it's a collective benefit. So it's like the data system should be designed and operated to benefit First Nations and indigenous people. So that's the first uh, principle. And of course, we based all our work on collaboration agreements and we decided that like as well, as digital autonomy and indigenous data sovereignty were core principles to our work. So we were designing uh, strategies in order to transfer the technology. So that's the way that we have a very extensive long version of the article, which talks about this, but that's one way that we decided to, uh, to I don't know, to incorporate collective benefit into our work. Then there is the authority con to control which is the recognition of the rights and in, uh, an interest of indigenous right, uh, of indigenous communities over their data should be recognized and their authority to control this data should be strengthened, strengthened, <laughs> sorry. So obviously uh, in, for us, it was very important to all our work. So we were funded by an international agency. So our products will only have to be in English, but for us, it was very important to make it accessible to everybody who we collaborated with. So we produce work in Spanish, a long version, a short version. So everybody could provide feedback and everybody could read the work, at least the people who we collaborated with. So that was very important for us. And in addition, we, uh, we produce a media piece, uh, which actually collects uh, the views and visions of the interpreters. And I'm gonna share the link with you later. But, uh, and of course we allocated funding for this media piece to be translated <laughs> and we paid for all the work. Uh, everyone got paid in this project to attend the workshops, to do anything. So that was very important for us as well. And then, uh, so uh, responsibility to communicate how data will be used to support self-determination and collective benefit of indigenous people. And for us, the way, the best way to do that was to help, uh, to hold a series of workshops to incorporate their visions into the work and into the methodology. And then the last one is ethics. So is all processes will, will contemplate power and resources asymmetries and how this affect indigenous rights and human rights. And they suggest that uh, indigenous representation should be essential in all stages of the work. So we included from the design of the proposal, we included indigenous people within our work team and we, like all the work we produced was in collaboration with indigenous uh, interpreters in this case. Okay, so now <laughs> I'm gonna talk a bit about the workshops. So we decided to do three workshops. First, um, one on conversational agents, one on indigenous data sovereignty, and the last one on gender. And the idea of these workshops was uh, to align the design, not only of the agent, but of the whole uh, project, with the needs, aspirations of the people who we collaborated with. So uh, I'm gonna talk first about the conversational agents workshop. So the idea of this workshop was to provide people with the basis to first understand what a conversational agent is. 
to understand some of the benefits, but also some of the risks and the limitations of conversational agents. We talk of things like data ownership or privacy, other things related to data. And then we work on an exercise to design a conversation so we can align the user's expectations with the actual like the conversational agent. Uh, and what, what's important here is that the requirements for the system, at least the system that we wanted to build were the following two. The users should actively, actively collaborate on the production of the resources and the tools um, to the recurrent interaction with the system. So obviously in order to gather the data, we'll need people to interact with the system so we can actually get the data, no? So that was the first part. And I will, as well, if they wanted to have share resources and like share knowledge, well, they'll have to build it themselves. So we will give them the tools, but they'll have to be part of a community which will build the, the resources. And then we will need to find within the group of interpreters, a structure that will allow us to transfer the technology. And I think this was very important. <laughs> so this uh, workshop, we actually try to evaluate this, uh, these requirements, uh, but we identify some functions that people would like to have. So they will ask, they will uh, like the conversational agent, basically to help them on their day-to-day -day tasks. Things that they wanted, for example, is to get access to, for example, uh, formats to create contracts. So they can have that already there. Then they to collect payment information if they have been delays, if there's issues, no? then consult legal information if there has been changes in the laws and regulations. So these are the type of things that they that interpreters wanted from the system. Yep. Uh, but it turns out that their expectations in terms of why, what they wanted their interaction with the agent be like, uh, they did not want to take an active part on developing the technology and they did not want to take an active part on actually collectively building resources. So, uh, and as well, we were not able to identify at this time a uh, structure within the organizations which will enable us to transfer the technology. So, uh, so that's already, as you can see, is going to be problematic, like <laughs> in order to develop the system that we wanted. But uh, then I'm going to talk about the other workshop, which is indigenous data sovereignty. Um, okay. Uh, so as I said, there's three workshops. Uh, so first, the intent of this workshop was to reflect on the relationship between indigenous data and the rights, needs, and aspirations of indigenous nations, and to explore how to align our work with indigenous data sovereignty. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the type of things that we covered within this workshop. Uh, so first, we talk about data and power. So obviously <laughs> central to understand anything that has to do with data is how power structures relate to not only the design, the collection, the interpretation, the validation, the ownership, the access and the control of data. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then obviously all of these issues strongly relate with the context, which in the case of indigenous nations, a uh, key consideration is colonization. So colonization for, in, for First Nations brought about the devaluation of indigenous knowledge systems, indigenous data systems, and actually the replacement by external imposed colonized well, systems imposed by the colonizers. And these power asymmetries which were established in the colonies, uh, no surprise, they carry on until this day because most of the data systems in post-colonial countries come from the colonial period. So these power asymmetries that we can see that come from, uh, and particularly from the colonies, uh, have serious impacts within data cycles. And a very easy way to think about it is, obviously the dominant ideas and narratives decide or dis the design of the data. So the data is thought about from certain perspectives and the perspectives tell them include the visions of indigenous people. Then that data, which is designed, then is used to measure gaps, development, and whatever is needed in a country, particularly in public policy. And then those gaps and whatever is identified then is used again to develop new data. So obviously these cycles do not favor indigenous people and have been actually very detrimental to their development, I would say. And I think that's very easy to see in indigenous statistics. So statistics which relate to indigenous nations, they tend to 
focus on disadvantage, dysfunction, deprivation, difference, and disparity. I think if you think about any indigenous data that you have seen published by official figures or governments, they tend to <clears throat> they, they tend to follow this. Uh, and obviously, this not only reinforce, reinforces harmful stereotypes about indigenous people, but the data that they we actually have or the data that is available. Uh, well, doesn't align with their views, with their culture, and it does not respond to their actual needs. So the data is not controlled by them, but they don't have any power over it. So this is gonna be very problematic. And in order to understand that, and at least to put it into context into the workshops, we talk about the national census of populations in Mexico. Uh, so I don't know, I guess everybody, every country has some. Uh, the ones in Mexico started in 18, 1895, and the last one was in 2020. So they happen every 10 years, and we had had 14 of them. But what is interesting, according, or at least the, the things that we reflected on in terms of census, was the way that indigenous people are characterized within this census. So what is interesting is that <laughs> the visions, or like the way that they're characterized, has changed over time, but the changes have always aligned with the government's uh, like intentions or what they want and what they need. And I think this is very clear and the sense that the only constant criteria in Mexico to identify indigenous population has been indigenous languages. That's the only constant. They had like what they eat, what they wear, like other things have been included in depending on the census, but the only constant has been indigenous uh, speaking indigenous languages. And I think something that is very interesting uh, that comes about in the census is self-identification as indigenous and race have not been added to most of the census, I think, except to the last one. And what's very interesting is the relationship between the non-inclusion of these characteristics and what is called in Mexico, el mito del mestizaje. So there is this idea that Mexico is a mestizo country that is a that that idea is central to the construction of the national identity in Mexico and is based on the idea that Mexico is a modern nation and in order to be a modern nation people in Mexico are not indigenous and therefore they, everyone is mixed race so that idea has been promoted by the government as part of national identity and in order to support that national identity the suppression of self identification and other characterizations of indigenous nations and indigenous people has been suppressed from the census and just to get an idea of how important that, that characterization is and the difference with, with uh, indigenous language speakers is that we know that in general, the percentage of indigenous language speakers is decreasing every, like, every year, all the time. So we're losing languages. I think that's happening in Spain, that's happening everywhere. So you can see these figures decreasing generally, but on the other hand, if they, they included things like self-identification self, uh, of indigenous, the case is that figures are actually rising. So this is not good for this narrative of Mexico as a modern nation, or at least what the modern nation that the government wanted to promote. So, so you can see how the census having a tool to create this idea of a national identity. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> uh, okay, so well, well, this idea we reflected obviously on, on, the, on the importance of data, on indigenous data, and particularly, uh, I hope that this lets you see a tiny bit of why the, actually the lack of agency and control of indigenous people over their own data not only limits their ability to take and make informed decisions, but to make local strategies and to create policies that are actually adequate to their own languages, traditions, and views of the world. And actually, this undermines the rights to autonomy and self-determination, which in the case of Mexico, they are granted by the article second, the second article of the constitution, but on an international level, they're part of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and are articles three and four. So therefore, in order to actually uphold these rights, it will be very important that the power and the autonomy, uh, sorry, the power <laughs> and the ownership of indigenous data relies within indigenous communities. And therefore, uh, it's very important to have data sovereignty. So that's why we kind of discuss in our workshops. Uh, and then it's interesting to, I'm gonna talk very briefly about the perspectives of the people who actually participated in the workshops. So obviously they understand the importance of 
having language as a key indicator of like being part of an indigenous population, but there's other things that they'll consider important, like knowing the culture or actually being born in within a community. But uh, another thing is that they see obviously language as a key way of getting access to justice and to education. Obviously people who do not speak Spanish, for example, who go to hospitals cannot get proper care because there is no people who actually speak their own languages even within their own communities. Obviously that's a huge problem, the same with education. Uh, so, and then the idea was to actually discuss how to apply indigenous data sovereignty within our project, but there was not enough understanding of what the agent will do, what data, what was going on. So we actually spent a lot of the time on that workshop also to explain people like again what we were trying to do and then just like this is almost the end and then we talk about gender so in order to incorporate the gender perspective into our work we decided to do two workshops well separate focus groups one male one female we know binary is not the best way of doing it but the fact that we work with indigenous people made it like this was the adequate like at least for the work the people who were working on the, the adequate division and we asked them about first about their form like the so their experience like while forming as interpreters like their education or training their work experience and their future aspirations and what was very clear and all the workshop was first that people at least interpreters in Mexico the ones that we work with they don't see interpretation as a career they don't like there's so many barriers that they actually don't see these as something that's why they I think they collectively didn't want to gather data because they don't see this as a career path actually what they most see it like is as a voluntary thing that they do in order to help their their communities or to preserve their cultures and languages so this is a big gap like we were assuming that they see this as a career path and currently they don't like there's just so many barriers and then uh, most of the issues that they perceive in terms of their experience uh, they don't associate them with gender. They they tend to associate them with the fact that they're indigenous. So that's something, uh, another important consideration. So based on the workshops and on the research that we do, uh, so the outcomes that we consider most adequate for this work will be to create spaces for direct communication and collaboration within interpreters so they can share information and knowledge that they want or to use tools for the creation of shared resources like wikis. But we did not see the need to create an AI system because basically the fact that there was no organization and structure to make the, the transfer of the technology will obviously undermine data sovereignty and digital autonomy, which were principles important for us. And then the user's expectations was not to take part in the design of the project. So obviously then the co-design will be an issue. And finally, I can share with you that we made this media piece that you can access it as a website. Uh, which has the papers, like all the versions, but it also has videos uh, where interpreters in their own languages share their own experiences or their work. And that would be, oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Sophia. <laughs> interesting talk. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions uh, here or in the chat yet. Yeah, uh, my question is more biased to the, to the technical part needed just to gather all this information because I guess that not all the indigenous languages uh, have written representation, but only could be more or less be phonetically represented. And uh, then it's a uh, I guess it's difficult just to uh, transcribe that because it needs uh, that people transcribing that have the information to do that. And then uh, uh, in case you have uh, written representation, you don't have always a font to represent that because if you are using uh, symbolic representation instead of an alphabet, then you need a specific font just to represent that. Oh. Yeah, that, that's that's a, that's a very good question. Though uh, in our case, all of them are interpreters, which interpret from their own languages to Spanish. So the system was going to be in Spanish, and all the work was going to be in Spanish, which is like very lucky for us. 
a shared language, at least within the work group that we were, yeah, that we were in to work with. But yeah, generally for making translators, that's one of the big issues. Uh, again, uh, access to data, many, many other issues are reasons why we chose again to, to work uh, on this design proposal and not other design proposals because yeah, yeah. there's a lot of variety. So, and at the academic level, uh, the relation with linguistics because depending on the language, sometimes uh, there are, uh, there are mm -hmm. different ways to, to look at it in different languages. I, I'm not a linguist, but I know that there are several languages where it is more difficult to to, to tell about numbers and to tell about the future or past events or uh, whether the, the words are genderless or are gendered. Or, yeah, for us, for example, something that was useful is to think for them to develop a, their own glossary because they're legal terms. So for example, they do not exist in other languages or concepts. So for example, to even have ways of explaining that to the people who they translate or interpret for will be very useful. For example, some of the resources that they wanted to build relate to this matter. So like actually how to, how to actually do the interpretation and what could be useful for them. So that was one of the proposals of things that could be done. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. It was very nice. Um, I, I, I was uh, curious to ask you like, uh, uh, about activities for engaging the policymakers because uh, like we were talking about people, the interpreters, and the developers, but most of the problems like can be solved at a higher level. So, what, what are these kind of uh, activities? Uh, uh, and, the yeah, so this is interesting because our, our main aim was to work directly with indigenous groups and in particularly there is tensions between government and indigenous groups and organizations in Mexico. So our aim was to support them and give them tools to then for them to use them however they see fit. So we did not want to take part on that mediation. We think that the right people to actually mediate that are interpreters and their organizations. So our aim was just to just to help them to give them tools. Uh, yeah, but it's complicated. They're actually like now the the, the thing is like they 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 it's very unstructured. So like the for example the general law in linguistic rights is recent. So so. There is organizations, but only for certain languages. Like Oaxaca is very strong and they have many organizations for translation and interpretation, but that's not the case in the North. For example, as you see, there is very few speakers mm -hmm. and there's some that don't even have organizations for their own languages. So this is very problematic. There's, there's no structure. And one of the hopes that we had is like, we wanted the agent to like for individual organizations to be able to gather data on their own translators and eventually possibly gather national data if people consent and everything went accordingly because there is a lot of people who do not work within organizations and are doing this work voluntarily within their own community. So you have to think as well that in indigenous communities because they have autonomy and self-determination, they could have different organizational structures and governments. So, communities work differently and act differently. So we wanted them to give them as much autonomy and abilities as we could without having any inference on the way they were gonna use the data. And that, that was what we wanted to do. Even on these problems when you are uh, in the do you see any other tool in the future uh, more like uh, beyond the, the glossary one or the knowledge one because that would be like at least the, 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 the simple way to, to help to give a, 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 a an infrastructure, a tool to for them to create a glossary to I don't know, the medical and to the legal and so on. That's pretty much the, the idea of the, of the future. And this is that tool specific. But do you see another step forward beyond that part, beyond the glossary of the ontology? Because it's very difficult to. Because it's all talking and there is no writing, so this uh, right now it's not related to and this structure uh, to do another kind of uh, software or technology for them to use. Yeah, maybe like a system for them to create uh, 
the old world and politics. Yeah, well, right now, right now. Well, the problem generally it's uh, I would say it's funding, like because like we didn't want the system to act that well, we'll think uh, extractively. So we wouldn't want people to give their data and they wouldn't get anything back. So that's why we established a dialogue within interpreters because the organizations did want the statistics. Obviously, it would be very helpful for them to have these resources. But we didn't want users to actually interact with the system for something that they didn't find useful. So the problem is that there is very, uh, as uh, right now what we see is like the structures, they're very horizontal. So there is no much, uh, like I will say like right now because of the way that things are happening or this like there is not much alignment between the individual interpreters and the organizations and that's an issue that I think we're beyond uh like not not even capable of solving but like we don't want to actually infer in that or we don't have to have to have anything to I don't think it's our field to talk about that so we didn't see a way of actually having a way of constructing something that will help both uh, the organizations and the individuals. So if we didn't find a way, like, I don't know, perhaps someone else can find another way, but for us, it was important that everybody would benefit and we couldn't find a better solution uh, because obviously if you have resources then you pay and then you get a census and then you pay everybody to answer the questions and then we get the data and boom, we don't need the AI, no? But that's not the case. There is no resources for that. So our solution to try to gather the data was like a collective, uh, I don't know, give and take, like everybody benefits, but that's not actually the, the what we found. Uh, and that I think like this highlights important not actually going to do field work because we assume this will work. Obviously, we asked for funding and we wanted to do the project. But when we talk to individual interpreters, the, the situation is very different from what organizations. Uh, want or their needs or their aspirations. So for us, it was very useful to actually talk to potential users and that would make the whole difference between making the system or deciding that it wasn't uh, gonna work. Yeah. Questions? But I think the approach is very interesting because usually here um, we talk about having these participative methods, but it's usually something that they just do to you know check some points. And it it usually goes more for the for the use phase of the last phase of the de development. And you put it right at the beginning, and you and you had let's say the correct to say okay, so AI is not the solution here. And and I think this is, I mean, it, it's very inspiring as a, as an approach. I was curious to know more or less how many people participated, and if you mix people from different indigenous communities because you you show the map. Yeah. Mexico is yeah, yeah, yeah. So big. So I wanted to know if, if you if you mix them and if you saw any cultural differences or barriers, um, hmm. maybe interacting or in the language or whatever that also um you know help you to, to get to this conclusion. Ah, very well, thanks. Uh, first, something that I will say it's important. I, I as you said, not only about integrating uh users or like people into the design or all the stages of development, but generally. There is a bias assuming that the technology that you need in order to solve a problem, you already know what it is. So I think first actually understanding the problem and trying to find the right tool, it's already a big gain. Because in this case, this was definitely, we could have done it. We could have applied for more funding and done it, but this was not gonna have any impact. So we decided not to go forward with it. But I think that's already first a very big issue that is very seldom discussed. Most of the AI work focuses on work that is done with AI, that problems that can be solved, but there is a huge bias of what of all the problems that cannot be solved with that, uh, what is what goes behind the decision-making of actually choosing not to de deploy this technology. I think there's very few work in that field. So I, I, we hope that this helps <laughs> cover a tiny bit of that gap. Uh, and in terms of the differences, well, it's important to highlight, for example, most people here come from different communities. So they speak different languages and they're different cultures. So Oaxaca has a huge diversity. So most of these people actually had never met before, like the interpreters, they had never interacted. And that was one of the big problems because it's so like varied that there wasn't like yet a, uh, like a community of interpreters and I think that's something that they already 
uh, if they wanted, they could they could like the tools proposed to build that like relationship and to have like strengthen their like bonds. But uh, we, given the time, given the budget, <laughs> we could only work with one, like we can only do one workshop. <laughs> so we only work in Oaxaca, but because it has a like, wide variety of languages uh, and diversity. So we kind of covered that, but you'll be obviously interested to see what happens in other states. Because for example, Antonio works in Yucatan and in Yucatan, they don't have so many. So Sepiadet is really big and they're like hugely influential now, but there's other states where the where the interpretation, like it, what's happening is completely different. So it's actually very diverse and it will be useful, potential <laughs> opportunity for us to do our work. <laughs> uh, to, to see what happens in other places. Like we, like with the people that we work with, with the, like with the environment that we were in, we think that this was not viable, but that just obviously don't mean that there is no potential to to try to build something like that somewhere else or with another community. But yeah, that was my, my follow up yeah. question. If you so if you think so now that we have this kind of uh, methodology, how easy do you think that is to apply it to uh, I mean or extend this work or apply it to other sectors? Here, for example, we work a lot uh, on healthcare issues, for example, I don't know if this do you think it's easy to, to translate it or to put it into other uh, topics oh. or research. I think generally I'm completely against universalization. I think concept, context is everything. Like here, a lot of the principles, everything that we work with is based on indigenous people's work and their own visions and what they need and what they want. I think other contexts will require to do a similar like check on other things. Uh, because for example, it's very interesting because the field of medicine, even though it's one of the highest regulated or whatever, in terms of what's been going on with indigenous populations, like the atrocities that have been committed by medical like experiments and whatnot on indigenous communities is terrible. And many of the protocols and many of the work and many of the things that are related to their having their own ownership and control over data relates to medical data, which is very heavily regulated in other places. But <laughs> so it's interesting because I think that these data well, there are discrepancies on why, what they want, what they need, and the way that they think it will be best for them to actually achieve it. So I think the idea of actually looking into context and what people need from the beginning is useful, generally, I'll say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think I, for us, a very difficult thing in order to do something like this was to secure funding. And, <laughs> and I don't know, it's difficult as well to produce work that is not what people wanted, which was an AI system. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll find where to promote this. Now, any ideas are welcome. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, but I think it's thank you. Ah, see. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so if there are no other questions, then thank you, Sophia, so much for your talk. And she will be here. Uh, she started one month ago. So, yeah, you can always find her in the second floor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sí, ya 30 minutos. Wow. Sí. 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 Sí.